Welcome to tonight's Wealthy Webinar. And just as you all are filing in to join us for tonight's very exciting uh, webinar, let us know where you're tuning in from. For those of you who don't, know, who don't know me, I am Kristen, and tonight we have a very special treat for you with two lovely gentlemen who I've had the pleasure of working with for the past couple of years, well, almost couple of years, um, and it's this is just going to be an action-packed, we'll say action-packed webinar. So let's get rolling. I'll bring up the slides, and we'll, we'll uh, get the show on the road. So tonight, we are talking about the seven major challenges of the new economy and discover why it's getting harder than ever to get ahead and the four solutions to ever overcome these seven challenges with my good friends Bob Ferguson and Neil Cambridge. All right, so if you feel like you're working really hard but you're not making any headway, just know that you are not alone. Uh, what you may not realize is that we're all facing these challenges uh, that are making it more difficult than ever to get ahead and truly thrive. Now, these challenges are daunting, but thankfully, there are four powerful ways to ensure that you can overcome them. So in this webinar, you're going to discover the seven major challenges we're all facing and the new possibility available for people trying to get ahead. So what we're going to learn tonight, uh, the first is changes in the current market the seven challenges that we face in the new economy, the four solutions to overcome these challenges, and the growing market uh, to target, and the simple steps to secure your future, plus much, much more. So let's introduce our guests tonight. So first up is Bob Ferguson. So as a young man, Bob Bob pursued his career or other career tracks while his mom focused on building a Shackley business and started with a bottle of organic cleaner. And when his mom happened to leave a copy of her bonus check on the computer, Bob was very surprised to discover that she was making double what his late father was making uh, as a teacher for 39 years. And this was a big aha moment for Bob when, uh, when Bob realized it was time to partner with his mom and he has never looked back. And then we have Neil. So Neil, born in England, uh, Neil immigrated to the United States in 1978. From that point, he led a predominantly uh, entrepreneurial life as a business owner, facilitator, and coach. From technology to manufacturing to service, he has uh, led the way of innovation curve for the past 40 years. Uh, a, a primary interest is seeing a sustainable culture take hold in the majority of society. He is a lover of puzzles, which I can definitely relate to that one, and problem solving. Neil consistently seeks the harmony between people, process technology, and the natural environment. And in 2015, at 59, he left the management consulting field to become a network marketing professional as a Shackley distributor. So gentlemen, I am incredibly pleased to have you both here. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute pleasure. So just share a little bit about your experience in the entrepreneurial world and why you feel this is such an important topic to cover. Cover. Neil, over to you. Okay. Um, well, I have, I, I, I said I've on there, I've been on kind of the innovation curve, but most of it's been on the bleeding edge as opposed to the leading edge. And really, I've done a lot of startups uh, in my life, and I've done a lot of different um, things that I, I uh, have made me happy but they don't necessarily always take me care, care of me for the long term. So I love uh, starting up things and I love creating things, but I've had a lot of experiences with the challenge of sustaining them. And looking out there, uh, one of the things I've always had is trying to have do things with a purpose. And so I'm sort of committed uh, kind of for the rest of my life is to really kind of help other people um, really get ahead um, while living a life of purpose and uh, contributing to uh, hopefully all of us a better society. Excellent. Thank you. Bob? Well, <clears throat> so boiling down uh, a pretty long history is, is a challenge, but um, I'll just say that uh, I was entrepreneuring, but in the social space. 
Uh, it was actually when I, my first child was born and I realized that the funding for the program that I was running in a maximum security prison, I did start a program, a major program in a maximum security prison at age uh, 26. So uh, I guess I was entrepreneuring, just not necessarily in the financial end of things. So um, I became very adept at uh, living on air. But when my child was born, I go, boy, uh, funding is finished. Uh, what do we do? So my mother had started our entrepreneurial, our family's entrepreneurial business, which is now turns 50 this year. And uh, just because of a happenstance, I happened to be bring, I, I brought that bottle of organic cleaner to my mom to try. And uh, in the interim between 1970 and 1977, she had built a business. Now, it, uh, it, it occurred to me she was making money because I knew what my father had left at the time of his death in a car accident in 75. And I know she wasn't flying to Hawaii to visit my sister on that money. And so in the faint recesses of my mind, I kind of calculated that, yeah, she must, must be doing okay with that thing. But then when I talked to her and saw her check, I go, I think I said something intelligent like, is that per month or per year? <laughs> and so uh, it got, got my attention. And so, this is a particular kind of entrepreneurship that we're talking about tonight. Now, I'm familiar with other kinds of entrepreneurship. One of the great fruits of being successful in a business like this is you get to try other things. Well, one of the things I tried was I was uh, helped found a company in the sustainability space in California and uh, from Iowa. And uh, we burned through, what, four or five million dollars of capital. And the product was great. People loved it. We, it was, it was, we won a governor's environmental award, but we couldn't sell it fast enough. And all that has gone away. My humble little business that's run from my phone, and we run a multi, multi million dollar business. And um, I am working with, well, actually, if I pick this thing up, the thing that I'm talking on now, and this thing, and me, are the entire staff. And so there's all different scales of entrepreneurship. But what we're going to be talking about tonight is entrepreneurship that's open to people. Normal folks can learn the skills to do this kind of entrepreneurship. And all you have to do is talk to Neil, <laughs> talk to me uh, to find out exactly how challenging it is. In fact, if you look at the stats of people who have had successful businesses, some people, you know, right from the beginning, they're successful. Most people have to fail a number of times before they have gone to school enough to succeed. So we don't want to do that, right? We want an entrepreneur in a way that we don't have to hawk our firstborn and our house and everything else, only to have the thing crash. So let's uh, let's do it. Let's 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 hey, talk let's, about this. Let's talk about this because this is very timely. Right, so uh, I'm going to take on, you know, we're talking about the seven major challenges here and, um, you know, Barbara and I are going to flip back and forth. So let's just sort of get talking to this, the first one. And the first major challenge is that we're really entering into what we're calling the gig, gig economy. And if you think about uh, basically a gig, it's kind of like a rock band, you know, sometimes you play and sometimes you don't. And deal with it, you know, the gig economy is essentially, I think somewhere about 34% of the workforce in 2017 was in the gig economy and projected to be somewhere around 43%, which means that you're not employed by anybody, you're employed at will, and you don't have any particular um, secure future, you're just on contract at will. So given COVID, and my experience with some some friends who are business owners, companies are finding even more innovative ways in which to not have employees. Okay, so the traditional economy is gone. The gig economy is here. So it's making old ways of earning a living much less reliable. And if you think about forty three percent of the workforce having an unreliable income, it puts a lot of stress out there. So more and more people now kind of having to figure on multiple streams of income from part-time gigs or side hustles to get by. So four in 10 people, and that's kind of a, a statistic that I uh, now uh, I quoted about um, 
relying on this extra income to make enough money to make ends meet. And the point I want to make there is to make ends meet. That's not necessarily about having a great life. That's about just keeping my nose above water. So if you don't have a plan B, that's a pretty risky proposition too. And I think most people can probably remember what happened in 2007. And in 2007, a lot of jobs disappeared overnight. And it wasn't just the jobs that disappeared overnight. A lot of 401k plans disappeared overnight. So a lot of the benefit income disappeared. So what is your plan B going forward? And that was something that hit me at 59, uh, looking out to the future, was I didn't really didn't have a plan B. Oh. So, <clears throat> thank you, Neil. That's great. So, what is the second major challenge? That is the speed of inflation. So, even if you have a great income and thought about, have you thought about really how quickly inflation is eroding your buying power? So, in the new economy, the middle class income is quickly disappearing, and much of this has come at the hands of inflation. There's a lot of other factors, but inflation will inexorably eat away. And if you think about an inflation rate of a point and a half or two, and over 10 years, how many people are making 15 to 20% more than they did 10 years ago? So, so the sad reality is the average person income really isn't sufficient to buy the things that we correlate with being middle class, you know, a car, a home, kids, college education, but afford your family's basic healthcare costs. So here's the cost of, here's the, this, this curve really pretty much tells the whole thing. There's the cost of housing and there's household income. Household income has gone up since 1960, but it's gone up much less than the cost of housing. And the cost of housing is just one of the costs, right? Over to you, Neil. So we want to get, thank you, thank you. And just a, you know, a couple of points back on that is that middle income households have decreased from 61% of the population to 51% from 1971 to today. And that the wealth of families is no higher than it was two decades ago, which is pretty staggering. So, Chris, the next slide. So, as I made the point there, two decades, wage growth is an issue. And... When I first came to America in 1978, I was just blown away by America, by the access to everything, the fact that people had 2.3 cars, the fact that you could live anywhere, the, the income, the, the food was abundant. That has absolutely done a 180-degree change in the 40-odd years that I have been here. So wage growth, you know, is, is really not keeping up, particularly with where it needs to go in the future. Bob? Okay, fourth major challenge, income insecurity. So I guess the question, folks, is how would you be affected if you couldn't work for months or more due to illness or injury or a pandemic? What if your company laid you off or went out of business? What would happen? It's not a thought that a lot of us want to entertain. So I think many people are realizing the importance if they can find a way to create a reliable passive income stream, I think people are understanding that that would be very important, particularly if that income stream is resistant to economic disruptions. All right, and the fifth massive challenge, all right, is basically the debt load. And that is a really scary proposition when we start looking at the younger population. 64% of millennials feel financially stressed, with 15% of their salaries going towards student loans. That's an incredible amount of money when you think about that's just towards the loan. Think about what's happening. Well, you know, talked about the housing issue. Think about food, everything else that has to go on. So college grads are finding themselves unable to pay off their loans, let alone buy homes or start families. And we know, I think we've all heard the stories there about so many kids are actually, you know, more and more kids are living at home with their parents, not necessarily by choice. That wouldn't really have been my choice. All right. 
So go on to the next and next slide, please. Well, and just a quick note on that too, Neil, is yeah. um, that I think is so important with even coming out of university. It's you don't have that guaranteed career waiting for you at the end. I've known many people who've come out training for something specific and having to go into a different field because the jobs are just not there. Um, and so that's also something to take into consideration when paying off these loans as well. And and we saw that, you know, kind of the, in the 80s and the 90s where suddenly, you know, a, a four-year degree wasn't enough to get a good job and a graduate degree wasn't enough to get a job. And then depending upon the industry you were in, um, so it, it's a really complex problem out there, particularly for young people moving forward. Okay. Sixth major challenge, healthcare. So, and particularly in this country, but I think in around the world, particularly the way we have it set up, the healthcare system is really on an unsustainable path because it focuses, in my view, on the wrong thing. It focuses on sick care instead of well care. So it's far more, pro and it is more profitable to treat disease than it is to prevent it. And I was at a meeting in Washington, D.C., and a fellow was talking to, uh, who ran the software for one of the large uh, entities in the government, and he said he had a really innovative uh, solution to diabetes, and he uh, pitched a number of large pharmaceutical companies, and they said, well, it's very interesting, but we're not interested. He said, why aren't you? He said, because there's no money in diabetes cure. There's money in diabetes treatment. So that's part of the mentality. So if we're not focusing on well care, and if we're not individually, I think that's a really important thing. If we're not individually focusing on our own well care, then we could be in for a difficult time in the years ahead. And, and just to kind of feedback on, on that piece is, the last stat I knew is this is the only country in the world where you can go bankrupt due to medical costs. and. Um, at the homeless shelter uh, back in the city that I used to live in, I interviewed the director there, was that 80% of the people in that homeless shelter were there due to med medical costs. They had basically lost their home due to medical costs. Seven being the challenge. And next slide. So this actually was one that really spoke to me because I led a very entrepreneurial life. I started a lot of companies. I had, um, I tell people I had a lot of good stories, but not a lot of assets. And at 59, um, I kind of looked ahead and I couldn't see the future. And I definitely couldn't see the future with re respect to the things that um, my myself and my wife, Paula, really wanted to do. So in 1983, over 60% of the workers had some sort of defined benefit plan. And today, less than 20% have access to a retirement plan. It's essentially evaporated. Let's go to the next slide. And the average person retiring today at 65, and I'm very quite personally focused on baby boomers, just because that's my, my age group, is that with only $41,000 in assets. So the idea of you, you know, when I go back 40, 50 years ago, sort of saying retiring and cruising and just kind of going off and doing the things that you want to do has disappeared. So most retirees will run out of money years before they, they no longer need it and never mind leaving something to posterity. And never mind, you know, in terms of posterity, never mind thinking about that legacy that, you know, that Bob was fortunate to pick up with his mom for the business. Next slide, Bob. Okay, so these challenges are daunting, but there are ways that we can overcome them. And one of them is education. One of them is retraining. One of them is learning something new so that you develop new skills and you can go apply those skills. The second one is I'm fond of is leverage. Ideally, you'd find some way to multiply your efforts and enable you to speed up your rate of success. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Passive income. Passive income or income that comes in independent of the hours that you work. I think that's our definition. A classic definition is if you're a songwriter or the Beatles, or maybe not even the Beatles, uh, or you're J.K. Rowling, uh, you write some books and 
the royalties come in for a long, long time. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways of earning money, but uh, let's we're going to be talking about a way that you can actually work now and get paid indefinitely in the future. Because where I'm, we're, we're living in the, in the middle of that reality. Uh, that's something that's been a reality for my, my family for 50 years. And then finally entrepreneurship. Now, again, we're not talking about all kinds of entrepreneurship. We're not, the kind of, we're not talking about the kind of entrepreneurship that you have to fail four or five or six times. I mean, Disney went, went bankrupt five times or six times before he, he had it right. So most people don't have the stomach to do that. The kind of entrepreneurship we're talking about is gives people and families from all walks of life a real possibility of getting ahead. And it is, in fact, a very powerful strategy for dealing with the seven major challenges that I just covered because it's a real business. So... Let's talk about the power of choice. In fact, on all scales, if you look at the macro scale, at the Elon Musks and the people who are truly creating the future, our future, the Steve Jobs, our future is in fact shaped by entrepreneurs. And you know, let me, uh, I'm gonna move us out of the way here so I can see. Okay, so, um, so entrepreneurship, again, of the kind that we're talking about, is a way to gain more control with the power of choice, with less stress, more options, and in fact, a more fulfilling life. And so what are some of the benefits of being our kind of entrepreneur? Well, you never have to worry about being laid off. No one can fire me. I own my business. You can contribute and help others. I like that. I spend a good bit of time on my business, but I spend I think today I spent at least half of my time on civic and civic activities. There's civic entrepreneurial activities, but there's civic activities. Um, you can build an asset that you own. You can control your hours. Unlike, and our kind of an entrepreneurship is not like having a small business where you can say you work, you, you can work your own hours, all of them. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, not like that. There are tremendous tax benefits and uh, you can be unique. You can express yourself through this. So, uh, and you can imagine how nice it would be to have flexibility in where you work. Basically, any place I have an uh, internet connection, I run a nonprofit here. We have a 12 acres and a straw bale barn. I want to go to the eco barn and work. Hey, we got really good internet there. So I can bring my, bring my laptop and my cell phone and I'm in business. So, and I, I, I'm personalizing, I can decide where I work, with whom I work, and if I wanna have lunch with my family or lunch with my friends, and if I have school-age kids, actually I have grandkids, my 10-year-old's birthday, 10-year-old uh, grandson's birthday, I can go down and visit them whenever I choose. And tax advantages, Everyone, uh, you know, I, I believe in paying the taxes that I, uh, that, I, that I owe, but who wants to pay more taxes? And if you can legitimately reduce your tax burden by running a business, why not? And this is a really good thing. You can decide when your weekends are. I know someone who's an avid skier and say, you know, everyone has to ski on the weekends. Do you have any conception of how long the lines are? for the lifts on the weekends. My weekend is like Monday or Tuesday or maybe Tuesday, Wednesday. It could be me Wednesday, Thursday, possibly even Thursday, Friday. But it's definitely not Saturday and Sunday, at least not when I'm skiing. So, you know, uh, our friends, Aaron and Annegret Dykstra, you know, they're, they're living that reality too. And uh, passive income. Uh, these are my beautiful friends, Carl and Robin Reeves May. I actually serve with Carl on a, on a, a board in our company. And um, her great, gra her grandmother started her business. And that was what, what was 65 years ago. And they have a tremendous business. And her next generations are being involved. I think that may be the only fourth or fifth generation uh, family. But uh, yeah, you can, you can get paid on customers. She's getting paid on customers, or at least the children of customers that her grandmother started 60, 65 years ago. 
Well, Tony Parker says kayaking on Monday morning. Oh, yeah. And so um, the issue is, and I've said, told you my little experience with starting a business that took a whole lot of money. Um, most businesses, most entrepreneurial businesses take a huge amount of money. You take a huge amount of risk. So what we actually do, and, and when we started our business, it was not an online business. It was a, basically a brick and mortar business. But, you know, you did out of your home or you're out of your garage or out of a you know, spare room in the basement. But the internet and network marketing really have changed that. Now, I don't touch a product that I don't use myself. Everything is at the speed of thought. Everything is, and so that completely democratizes our brand of entrepreneurship because really almost everyone has a smartphone now and almost everyone has a computer. If you got that, you're in business. And I'm just going to touch very briefly because Bob kept, uh, kept saying that our kind of entrepreneurship. And for the most part, I define an entrepreneur who lives for about 45 seconds. And it's when you sort of say, I know how to do something else better. And then everything that you have to do to climb the mountain kicks in. So I've started over a dozen businesses and give you one of them. We put a million dollars in, got product into 1,500 stores across 22 states, and that was not enough to make it. Not one of my businesses except one survives today after 35 years. This is about an entrepreneurship that says, I know how to get a better future. I know how to do this better and leveraging the net. So let's take a look at the market. So if you're going to be in leveraging the market, then any good business wants to look at what's the best markets to be out there and looking at consumer behavior. So moving into personal care, prevention, and wellness is going to be essentially the big 800-pound gorilla in the market, whether that's coming into baby boomers and even if you dip back into uh, millennials and pivotals or Gen X, Gen Z, as we call them, they're really tapped into this. Next slide. So we're on this wellness revolution, and it's kind of been building like a wave coming out of the ocean for a long, long time. Some, some aspects have been the green revolution, some aspects that have been about the holistic and nutrition revolution. But this now is really coming into forefront with and you'll you'll see it you'll just you'll see it in the products that you buy today you'll see it in the supermarkets you can buy today you'll see it online in the advertising today we're all about health and wellness so it affects not just the things that we look at to treat illnesses or get better energy it also is the types of things that we use are on our body it's the types of things that we use to clean our sheets to clean our home we're really looking at a very a big 360 in terms of what we need what we mean by wellness but basically it is a a very very big industry by virtue of the numbers that you saw prior to that so the health and wellness industry is predicted to grow over the next 50, uh, 50 years. And just a couple of things on that is that 56% of the people buy some kind of nutrition uh, online these days. And 86% 86 intend to purchase in the future. And over one third third of them purchased online after seeing something promoted uh, in the media. And actually, 84% agree that the future preventative medicine are going to be the important to me and my family. So there's a big, big demand out there. And that's why a lot of us here are really engaging in that. So what's behind this? We have an aging population. We have a confluence of a number of things. And I tend to, you know, I used to do a presentation that talked about phase changes. There were phase changes in with the wheel. There was phase changes with the Gutenberg printing press. There was the phase changes with the railroad. And we're now at this con confluence of the internet and all these components that have been building for the third past 35, 40 years that are now creating a 
entirely different market. And and what I really liken is a is a people to people business model. So we increased awareness, a shift of holistic health and awareness, and concerns about our community. We have more purpose driven people and businesses today. All right, over to you, Kristen. I will take it over from here. Um, and thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing because this is, I mean, especially what we've gone through over the, well, since March, and for some people before March, depending on where, where in the world you're located, um, this is something that is so prevalent now. And I think more and more people are opening up to the idea of, hey, you know, this is probably the best time to move into a spot where you can be an entrepreneur online. So I'm gonna do a quick recap and then we'll say good night. So just a quick recap of the seven major challenges we're facing. So the first one, of course, is a changing economy. Things are not like what they were. Even when I started working, which really wasn't that long ago, <laughs> it feels like it, but it really wasn't. Um, we have growing inflation. We have slow wage growth, income insecurity. Nobody's really feels secure with their job anymore. Um, at least those of you who are still secure with their job, that's awesome, but I know many who aren't. Massive debt load, soaring health care costs, and lack of retirement benefits, which means that for many, especially, um, you know, I know I'm seeing it more for boomers, but also in for my generation and for the generation that's coming up after, the chances of having a pension um, or social security, whatever it might be, wherever your respective country is, is, is just not an option anymore. So again, these challenges are very daunting, but the four powerful ways to overcome them are through, as Bob said, through education, through leverage. And by leverage, you know, this allows you to multiply your efforts and get this and speed up your path to success. And this doesn't mean you multi it multiplies your efforts. It doesn't mean you physically multiply your efforts. It's utilizing tools to help that happen. Uh, passive income, which allows you to earn on something you've done in the past, royalties. I like to call it beach money. You earn while you're at the beach. <laughs> and there's a great book on that. And also entrepreneurship, which gives you new possibilities for getting ahead and can give you the power of choice in your life. So let's talk about the success formula. So if you can find an opportunity in the right industry at the right time with the right business model, that's a very critical piece, you'll have the wind at your back and the best chance for success. So how do you get started? So if you're interested um, in exploring the benefits of becoming an online entrepreneur, what I recommend is that you get in touch with the person who invited you to this event and ask them to give you a guided tour of their business center. And in this tour, you're going to discover the market and why it's experiencing such phenomenal growth. The high quality consumable products our customers buy from us online every single day, how you can create sales without selling. And I'm not saying that sales don't happen. It's just not having to be the sales type person and also the 60 year old supplier that we've partnered with. You can also learn the business model that we've choose, the competitive advantage or our secret sauce, the fabulous benefits how you can do it in your spare time and the best part and i think one of the most critical pieces is how you can start on a budget there really is no barrier to entry uh, which gives so many more people the opportunity to work at home so i want to thank you all for joining me tonight uh, for joining me bob and neil this has been incredibly exciting and bob and neil thank you so much for sharing and being here tonight are there any final words you want to say before we close it off neil over to you I just really appreciate my Kristen. Thank you very much. And also, I just want to say, you know, it's been five years with Bob and it's been, and also many of the people in our network. So I'm very, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to uh, actually be looking ahead into the future in a very positive way. So grateful to be here. And so am I. And I'm grateful to have wonderful friends and colleagues like Neil to work with. And I'm grateful for the Freedom Projects. It's, it's, it's a marvelous platform for delivering wonderful information to people. And uh, so uh, all, all, I, all I can say is that if you're looking to get ahead, if you're, if, you're, if you're frightened about the future, if you're apprehensive about your future, even if you aren't, and you're just curious to say, is there really some possibility of making residual income, passive income, and helping people, and having a sense of mission? Gosh, you know, 
nothing wrong with that. So thank you all very much for, uh, for tuning in and listening. Awesome. And thank you again so much, gentlemen. And we'll see you all next time. Take care, everybody.